All right, well, we're going to wrap up our shared meaning series. We've been going through this for probably close to three months now. We've navigated like 13 holidays in the process. But it's, it's been a good series. I've gotten lots of really good feedback, um, talking about things that, just to make sure that we're on the same page about what we're talking about. What we mean when we say things matters. And so we're going to do one last one today. It may be the uh, most unsettling of all of the shared meaning topics, and that's okay, because I like to make you feel unsettled. It's okay with me if you feel a little unsettled. It means that the Lord may be stirring your heart a little bit. So what I want you to do as we roll into this one is I want you to take a minute to consider your own reaction to this statement. And I think you've heard this statement before. What is your, uh, your own reaction to the statement, do as I say, not as I do? Do you love that statement? Do you use that statement? Never me, no way. When you think about the statement, do as I say, not as I do, what, when you think about it, when you really break it down, in essence, what we're doing is we're giving ourselves permission to be hypocritical. That is the basic meaning of do as I say, not as I do. But more importantly, there's a hidden statement in that statement. And that statement is that you should submit to me even if I have given you no reason to submit to me. Even if I've given you no example to give you credibility on what I say, you should just do what I say anyway. You should submit to my words and to my authority in spite of my behavior, in spite of my attitude. This is not a kingdom-minded attitude. This is not the heart of Jesus. It is not the way that Jesus thinks. Jesus actually says on many occasions in the Word of God and Scripture, he actually says, do as I do, frequently. For example, he says, love one another as I have loved you. After washing his disciples' feet, he goes on to say, now that I've done this for you, do this for one another. In the same way that I've done it to you, do for one another. And in another instance, he says that all these things that you see me do, even greater things are you going to do. So Jesus reiterates the idea not just to hear his commands and carry out blanket commands, but rather to emulate, to embody the, the qualities and the behaviors that he himself demonstrates to them. Jesus never goes to his disciples. He never goes to the crowds. He never goes to his followers and says, you should submit to me. You should follow my example and do as I say because you ought to. He never does that. Rather, it's the opposite. Instead of demanding that people submit to him, he insists on submitting himself to us. Now this seems backwards. This seems uncomfortable for us to think that Jesus, the Son of God, would lay himself down and submit himself to us when he is the one who is most deserving of our submission. But the more that we examine Jesus, the more that it becomes clear that submission is one of the most Christ-like things that a person can do. One of the most Christ-like things a person can do is submission. So as we work through our shared meaning, I thought it appropriate to address this very uncomfortable concept of what submission is. Over the last two and a half months or so, we've hit a variety of, of different shared meaning topics. We've talked about salvation. We've talked about grace. We've talked about honor. We've defined fellowship and forgiveness. We looked at ministry. We examined repentance. And then last week, y'all investigated what it means when we say the Bible. So today, once more, we're going to look at this word, a word that the world often abuses. And I would say that too often, it is often misused by the church as well. And that is this word of submission. We're going to talk today about the shared meaning of submission. And we're going to look at a lot of scripture in doing so. So eventually we're going to get to Ephesians chapter 4. So if you want to go ahead and move to Ephesians 4, we're going to go Ephesians 4, 5, maybe into 6 a little bit. And so you can go ahead and pull that up on your phone if you like, or you can flip over and mark it in your Bible. But before we do that, I want to make an acknowledgement.
I want to acknowledge the fact that nobody prefers to submit. None of you prefer to submit. If we're honest, you would prefer to be the one submitted to. I know this because it's human nature. The human nature is that we be in control of our own lives. We be in control of the world around us. We be in control of our environment. We be in control of our relationships and the people who try to have influence in our life, that we would possess that. And our desire as humans is that others would submit to our authority and our control. And it's our, our natural leaning. We're naturally going to be individuals who lean away from submission and towards control of our own life. So we're going to acknowledge this first, that it is human nature to resist. We're also going to acknowledge the fact that some of you here today have been mistreated by someone else's expression of the need for submission. Some of you, in a room this size, we can acknowledge the fact that some of you have been at a poor end of the reception of someone else's need for your submission. But the room is the same size as it was in my previous statement, so we must also acknowledge the fact that some of you may have been the deliverer of mistreatment for submission. We can't say that only—people can't only be the recipients of mistreatment of submission. We have to acknowledge that maybe we have to take some responsibility that we have misused it as well. So before we move any further, I want to acknowledge the human nature for us to resist submission— the fact that some of us may have had real, even traumatic experiences with someone else's need for us to submit, and then also that maybe at some point in our life, maybe recently, that we have misused this concept. So in recognizing all these truths, what I want us to do is I want us to allow God to speak to our hearts today about this topic. I want us to look objectively at Christ's character as a leader who submits as a leader who submits. So in Ephesians, really starting, really chapter 5 is kind of where people go. When, when we look at submission, and any time you hear somebody talk about submission, they'll probably cite or direct you to Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> if we look at what Ephesians chapter 5 really is, it's a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. It is a letter like to a friend. Like, is you, if you were to write a handwritten letter, you're still allowed to do that, by the way, just because email and text message exists. You can still put a thoughtful letter. This is the way they used to do it all the time. They used to write letters all the time, and so a lot of the New Testament is actually comprised of handwritten letters from one person giving instruction or care or affirmation to a group of people or to an individual. And so that's what Ephesians is. It's a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus, And the passage that we're going to read is often thought of as the submission chapter. But I believe that this is an unfair description. This is a a misunderstanding of what Paul's intention was for this passage of Scripture. Paul's writing a letter, and because he is writing a letter, it is intended to be read like, this is going to blow you away, a letter— It is intended to be read like a letter, but that's not often how we interact with the Bible, is it? Often we interact with it like it's a reference manual. Do you realize this? It's a verse of the day kind of thing, or, hey, Google, give me a reference in the Bible that can validate this concept. But that's not really the intent of what Paul is trying to communicate. He's writing a full letter, and I'll tell you, there's not six chapters in the letter. Those are the publishers. They added that later on. The chapters, the verses, the little subtext, the headings that tell you what the the upcoming passage is about, Paul didn't write that stuff. We added that stuff. So maybe a good challenge, if you've never done this before, is just to, like, go copy and paste it onto a Word document and delete all that and just read it like a letter. If you've never done that before, it brings a new experience to interacting with the text, with the scriptures. So this, quote-unquote, submission chapter will read very differently when it's read contextually within the way that was intended to be communicated. So we're going to start, and we're going to start before the, the submission parts, and we're going to start in chapter 4, verse 17. So if you want to start there, Ephesians 4, 17, and we'll just do a few verses here, verses 17 through 20. 
And this is what Paul says. He says, With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. So what he is doing here is he is saying the Gentiles, the people who grew up and live a life in a culture and a society that is far from God, that is away from our Jewish customs. Remember that Paul is a Jewish Christian writing this, and so everything that he says comes from the inspiration from God's word in the Old Testament, but the Gentiles did not have that. And so he's saying the people who grew up away from this did not understand these things, and they lived a life detached from the heart of God. But you're different. You are God's people, and you know these things to be true. This is, this is really a foundation statement that, that the Apostle Paul is setting here in chapter 4. And then, if you go on to read further, we're not going to read all of this part today, but if you go on to read further, Paul is going to continue to implore his, his listeners, his readers, to repent, to, to turn away from sin. He's going to speak about the evils of lying and stealing, anger, abusive la- language, and so on. And he's going to make it abundantly clear. He's going to make it crystal, crystal clear of what it looks like to belong to the, the Lord, to be devoted to Christ, and those who are devoted to themselves and living their own life into what the world says. So let's jump down to, to verse 31 and 32, and let's read what that says. Verse 31 and 32 says this, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. And so he's saying, alternatively to the way that the Gentiles lived and the way that the world tells you you ought to live, live this way instead. Purify your hearts and devote yourself to Jesus in the same way that he forgave and and treated you. Do so that for one another and for the world around you. All right, so this is Ephesians chapter 4. This is a, this is the, the, the unity chapter. This is the body of Christ chapter. But like I said, it's all meant to read and flow together in one cohesive thought, in one linear idea. So what we'll find next is that Paul is going to give instruction to what it looks like to be devoted believers. What it looks like for the, the people of God who say that I'm devoted to Jesus. And he's going to paint this picture through the beginning of chapter 5 of what it looks like to be devoted to Jesus. And he says this, imitate God. All right, so this is, as a result, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Now, we're not going to talk about his perfume. That's not what this is about, but this is a reference to incense and an offering to the Lord. But what he's saying, he's using language here that's going to tie in intentionally to what we see for the rest of chapter 5. But we're to imitate God, we're to follow his example, and to offer ourselves as a sacrifice as he did for us. And then verses 3 through 14, Paul begins to do this detailed description of the attitudes and the behaviors of the Christian believer. And so you can go and study this on your own time. Maybe it's a devotion for this week. Maybe you just take some time and just work through Ephesians chapter 5, and you see what Paul is emphasizing, and he's not leaving any gray area. This is what it looks like to be devoted followers of Jesus. And now we're going to go to verse 15. 15 says this, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity for these, in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We did that a little bit this morning, didn't we? among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. All right, verse 20 and 21, pay attention here. And give thanks for everything to God the Father 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And further, say and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So, pause for a second. Paul, starting in chapter 4, explains what it looks like to be of the world and to be devoted to the world. Then he goes on and says, this is what it truly looks like to belong to Jesus, to be devoted to Jesus. This is what it looks like. This is what we need to do in order to go from devoted to the world to devoted to Jesus. So therefore, this is how we live. And further, submit your life as to Christ. Everything you do, live out of submission as to Christ. And this is where our quote-unquote submission chapter begins. It begins with this statement in verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then we get a four-section subtext explaining what verse 21 means. And he says, for example, wives. For example, husbands. For example, children. For example, fathers. For example, servants. For example, masters. He's not giving blatant instruction about how all these people ought to behave. He is saying, all of you who call yourselves devoted followers of Jesus, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, and none of you are excluded. All of you, if you are listed in the subtext of verse 21, it's intended for you. Paul is not talking about authoritative submission in this passage. And this is often how we read it. We often read it about who has authority over who, because that is very important to us as humans. We need to know who's in charge and where we lie in the in-charge order. But that is not what Paul is saying here. He's actually confronting this idea of who is in charge and who is in authority. Paul is talking about universal submission. He is talking about the kind of submission that every single Christian shares in that we all participate in. In these next 20 verses, Paul speaks to both of those who are weak and those who are powerful. He addresses both of them, and he implores them both to be men and women who would submit out of reverence for Christ. Verse 21. Let's pause on the scripture for a second. And I want you to do something for me. In light of what Paul says here in verse 21, I want you to do something. I want you to think for a second about an important friendship that you have. Think about your best friend or a very dear friend that you've had for a very long time. You have somebody in mind? You have somebody in your heart that you kind of, it's instantly this person or somebody who who you feel like fits that description. Do you have that person in your mind? Because I'm not going to go forward unless you have that person in your mind right now. You've got it? John's got it. All right. I want you to consider for a moment, I'm going to ask you a loaded question about your friend. Whose job is it to lead in the friendship? Whose job is it to be in charge in that friendship? Whose job is it to take authority in that friendship? And whose job is it to submit? It's kind of a loaded question, isn't it? Perhaps you might think to yourself and argue back with me in your head? Neither of us submits, for we are equals, and there is no submission for those who are equal. Perhaps you would argue and say, well, the assertive one takes charge, and your head, you're like, well, it's obviously her. I don't take charge. She always takes charge, and I'm okay with that. Or you're the other way around, like, I'm always the one that gets to decide, and she is okay with that. Whoever the assertive one is, whoever the older one is, whoever the more experienced one is. Or, might I argue, that perhaps both submit one to the other. Perhaps in a real, authentic, meaningful friendship, each makes sacrifices for the other. That each serves the other. That each treats the other as higher than themselves. Do you realize that one of the most common reasons for the death of friendship or relationship, whether it's, whether it's a friend or whether it's a family member, whether it's a, 
a child or a parent, one of the most common reasons for the death of a friendship is a refusal to submit. I refuse to let you have your way in my life. I refuse to let you take charge. I refuse to, for you to say that you are more important. But I will tell you, based on what we've read today, that there's a truth in real submission, in real spiritual submission, that is this. That submission does not mean you're in charge of me. Submission means you're important to me. And there's a difference to that. And there's a reason why we hate submission so much, because we are afraid of losing control. But Jesus had no fear of that. He knew that he was fully secured and fully assured by his Father. And he could lay down whatever he wanted to, and in doing so, he made a statement. And he said, I'm laying my life down, not because I want Graham to be in charge of me, not because I think Ashley is the most wise person in the room, but just because they're important and they're worth it. And in doing so, I'm willing to serve. I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to yield. I'm willing to lay my life down so that you can be important. And when two friends come together and they love each other and they serve one another and they sacrifice for each other, what they're saying is that you are important. And in fact, in this moment, I'm treating you as the most important person in my life. I'm going to decrease so you can increase. Like Jesus, out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submission does not mean you're in charge. It means that you're important to me. And Jesus is the example of godly submission. The one most worthy of our submission. The, most, the one who should be walking to the room and saying, well, are you going to give me allegiance and reverence and tribute? That's what he deserves, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and yet he is the one who laid himself down and submitted to us. Do you realize this? Do you realize that Jesus submitted to you? We often would argue with that and say, well, he didn't submit to me. He submitted to the Father. He even said so. And you're not wrong. I'm not going to argue with that. But Jesus actually submitted himself to you, to your needs. It was to your needs. It was to your deficit that Jesus submitted himself. Jesus gave up his divine privileges. That's what the scripture says. He gave up his divine privileges. He was humiliated. He was rejected. He was tortured. And he was killed out of voluntary submission to say that you are important that you are valuable. He put your needs above his own. And that is the story. That is the image of authentic submission. That is the story and the depiction that Paul is articulating to us in these chapters in Ephesians. By examining the character and the person of Jesus, we learn this vital truth. Is it a truth that we must all take a moment to write on our hearts and live out on a daily basis? And that is this, that submission is not the cause of power. It is the evidence of love. It is not the cause of power. It is the evidence of love. When we submit, when we lay our lives down, when we put ourselves as second so we can elevate somebody else's first, we are joining with the heart of Christ. We are partnering with the Holy Spirit himself saying, out of reverence for you, Lord, I am declaring their importance. I am lifting them up. I am decreasing so they might increase. So I have some, some not so rhetorical questions for you. Whose job is it to make dinner? Whose job is it to pick up the coffee for the office. Is that the intern's job? Is that the new hire's job? Whose job is it to pay for gas? Whose job is it to say I'm sorry? Whose job is it to say I love you? Whose job is it to give credit or to apologize? Whose job is it when it appears 
to volunteer for the most unpleasant job. There's always an opportunity for a job that nobody wants. Whose job is it to volunteer for that one? Paul says it's the job of the humble. Jesus says it's his job to do those things. Ultimately, it's the job of the one who loves most. The one who loves most gets to do that job. Diane volunteers for the job so that Macy doesn't have to. In doing so, she says, you are the guest of honor. You are the most important. You are the hero of the room, and I will lay myself down so that you can be lifted up. What happens, friends, when everybody treats everybody that way? When we all treat each other with that kind of love? Isn't that what Paul is really talking about when he talks about unity in the body? Of this mutual, universal submission? When we all lay ourselves down, that we're not saying, it's my job to be in charge of you and your job to be in charge of this person, but rather, it's our job to look at each other and see each other as Jesus looks at us with importance of intrinsic value and say, you are of highest importance and I'm going to lay myself down and sacrifice myself so that you can be lifted high. In doing so, we obtain the true nature of the kingdom of God on heaven brought to earth. So today I want you to consider your position. Whether you're in a position where you call yourself rich or poor, whether you consider yourself a person that is weak or strong, whether you consider yourself young or old, high or low, no matter where you are, I'm telling you today as an echo of what Paul says and what Jesus demonstrates, that submission is meant for you. It is intended for you. It is a gift for you. For in it is the proof of God's love, and it is the proof that God's love has reached you. And it has affected you. If submission is hard for you today, I want to challenge you to reshape your thinking about it. Maybe for some of you it causes a recoil. It causes a guard to go up, a hesitancy, a resistance. That's okay. My hope today isn't to quote-unquote put you in your place. That's not Paul's intention. That's not Jesus' intention. It's to bring liberty and healing to your life. And so in reshaping your thinking, it causes us to realize that submission is not meant to mean dominance or authority. It's meant love and trust. That Jesus has given us every reason to love and trust him. That the Father in heaven is good and gracious and kind and faithful to us. And in doing so, in demonstrating those things, he has given us a reason to fully submit to him. And in doing so, we can take refuge in knowing that no matter what happens on this earth, no matter how I'm treated, no matter how I'm, I'm referred to, no matter what experience that I might endure, that my Father in heaven has already affirmed my place, and therefore I can be solidified in his family without fear of losing anything. And that's really what this, the fear of submission, are you, what are you going to take from me? But if God has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing, if we already have inherited heaven and the earth, and are co-heirs with Christ, then what then do we lose by submitting to him? He has given us every reason to give ourselves over freely to him. So I'm going to do this. We're going to read a little bit more scripture. And Jesse, if you want to help me close as I read through this scripture. We're going to read through these examples. Starting in verse 22. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, and Christ the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. And now we have, just real quick, we have three times more to talk about how husbands should submit to their wives in this passage. Just worth saying there, okay? For husbands, submission means love your wives just as Christ loves the church, as he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word, he did this to present herself, her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. 
In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it, just like Christ, just like Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a very great mystery, but it is an illustration of what the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger them by the way that you treat them. Rather, bring them up with discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Slaves. Okay, slaves. Let's, let's just contextualize. Let's just go with employees, okay? Think employees when you think slaves, okay? Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them with, all the time, not just with, when they're watching you, as slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. Masters or bosses, treat your slaves with the same, in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. And so what Paul does here is he lays out this beautiful explanation of what it looks like to belong to Jesus. And then he gives a careful explanation of all the examples in which mutual, mutual submission. Yes, it does look different depending on the role that you're in. Yes, wives and husbands have different versions of submission. Yes, masters and slaves and fathers and children have different versions of it. But if we reject submission by the virtue of our position, then we've missed Jesus. And we have to submit ourselves to one another as to Christ. The call of Christ and the hope of Paul is that all submission be our expression of love. In doing so, we say, you are important. At Lifeline, it is God's desire and it is my hope that we would be a people that treat everybody with importance. Not based on their skills or their education level or their income level or their charisma, but because they are important to Jesus. Because Jesus says that they're important, therefore we treat one another with importance. And in doing this, we resolve our own resistance to submission. So as I was thinking about this week, I was thinking about a moment in my life where submission became real to me. Do y'all remember like in the late 1990s when CDs were a thing? Do you remember this? There would be, um, I mean, we used to watch TV and not streaming services. And on TV, they had commercials. We call them ads now. And in the commercials, about every commercial break, there was some compilation CD of some greatest hits album. Do you remember this? Okay. And it was, sometimes it was like soothe listening. Sometimes it was jazz. Sometimes it was like this rock person. But then like uh, contemporary Christian music got in on it and they would do like um, Wow, which are like the, the greatest hits from 1999, Christian songs, like worship songs from 1999. Do you remember this? Any of you remember this? Um, I grew up in a context where this was an unfamiliar, like I didn't know what cr contemporary Christian music was. And I remember sitting when these would come on and watching TV with my sister and vocally mocking the music videos accompanying these songs of people in church with their hands raised at these Christian concerts. And we would be saying, what? Losers. What idiot? What are they doing? They're just ridiculous. And I would out of my mouth proclaim how silly it was for people to raise their hands in this expression of surrender and submission to God because they'd be foreign to me. I was living like those Gentiles that Paul was talking about. 
And then, my freshman year of college, I remember coming to a small, a pretty small worship gathering, probably less than a dozen people. And we were singing these songs, and I didn't know most of these songs up until this point in my life. And I remember being prompted by no one other than the Holy Spirit for the first time in my life, raising my hands in worship. And the first thought that occurred to me is, I am one of them. (laughs) But it was a humiliating moment for me because not only did it not make sense to me, I had already distanced myself by ridiculing those who were participating. And here I was having to come out of my own pride, my own arrogance, and raise my hands and overcome my superiority and say, God, it is not about me. It is about you. Now, I can't tell you how many more moments of submission God had to reveal in my life over the past 20-ish years, but there's been a lot of them, and I can't recount all of them, but I remember that one because it was so fresh and real to me in that moment. Some of us have such a resistance to even a godly submission that we won't even posture ourselves in a place of humility before the Lord. We won't even express through song. We won't sing. We won't raise our hands. We won't pray out loud because of what sacrifice it might be to us. So what I want us to do today, not because I prompt you, but because you're going to pray and the Lord will speak to you, but I just want us to sing a hymn. I asked Jesse to, to prepare for us. And I just want to sing this together and to invite you to participate in whatever submission looks like. Whatever the Lord might speak to you and say, this is what submission means to you in this season of your life. This is what it looks like to, to decrease so that I can increase. To decrease so the ones that I love could increase. This is just a space in our week. That's all it is. This, this isn't going to change what tomorrow looks like unless you want it to look different. But this gives us the space this week to gather and to worship together in concert with what Paul is saying in chapter 4, and so that we would obtain the virtue that he promises in verse, in chapter 5. So would you stand with me? I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to ask Jesse to sing, and you can express yourself in whatever you want, but just meditate on these words as we sing it together. Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your words that you've ministered to us today. Thank you that You have spoken to us directly and compassionately through the the words of Paul and the book of Ephesians. God, minister to us today. Speak to our hearts. Bring revelation and bring comfort to us in this scary thing. Help us to share in the meaning of submission as it pertains to you and your kingdom. Amen.